Um, so um, the first question is, what's the difference between surrendering one's likes and dislikes and self-torture? If they are not the same, why does surrendering feel like self-torturing? Is it because one fears that the divine will may be the exact opposite of what one wills in any given situation? Why and how to feel encouraged or motivated to constantly keep surrendering? <laughs> um, <clears throat> if we have surrendered our likes and dislikes, there will be no, nothing will be any torture for us. We, if, if, we, uh, if, we, uh, if we take anything to be a torture, that shows that we still have a dislike. Because we dislike a certain experience, but that experience is torture for us. <clears throat> if we truly surrender our likes and dislikes, our life will be extremely pleasant because there will be, <clears throat> we will have neither likes nor dislikes. So whatever happens, it will, be, uh, it will be the same for us. So we will not be troubled by anything. So all troubles arise because we have likes and dislikes. If if we are feeling if if we if we feel something is self torture, then we are not surrendering ourselves. But any 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 form of suffering is an indication, but we have not that is we will suffer only to the extent to which we have not given up our likes and dislikes. So self torture is uh, is the very antithesis of surrender. Surrender is extremely pleasant because we are free of likes and dislikes, so nothing will trouble us. We, we will also not find, because, because we have no dislikes, nothing will trouble us. Because we have no um, likes, nothing will cause us um, any, any, any um, no, nothing will feel pleasant to us. There, there will be a state of equanimity. That state of equanimity, that is the state of real happiness, the state in which we are not perturbed by whatever may happen. Um, so definitely, um, as I say, surrendering one's likes and dislikes is the very antithesis of self-torture, of self, uh, self the very antithesis of surrendering one's likes and dislikes. If you feel that surrendering feels like self-torture, you're not really surrendering. You haven't yet given up your likes and dislikes. You ask, is it because one fears that the divine will may be the exact opposite of what one wills in any given situation? The whole point of surrender is that we give up all our will. If we give up our will, then whatever the divine will may be, is fine for us. As Bhagavan says, Ninishtam enishtam, your will is my will. Imbadaku, that is happiness for me. That's what Bhagavan sings in uh, verse 2 of Arunachala Patikam. So if, um, if, we, if we are really surrendering our will, um, we will have no will that is opposite to the divine will. So long as we've got a will that is opposite to the divine will, we haven't surrendered. We are not even... So long as we want to retain any will of our own, we are not even willing to surrender. So uh, surrendering means giving up our own will, accepting whatever be the will of Bhagavan, that is <clears throat> ninishtam ninishtam. your will is my will, imbadaku, whatever your will may be. Even if you put me in hell, that's fine. It's your will, that's happiness for me. So nothing will affect us if we, even the worst torture will not affect us. The worst tortures of hell will not affect us if we are truly surrendered. If we've given up our likes and dislikes, even, even hell will, even the worst, uh, most terrible hell will become heaven to us because it's all his will. And his will is happiness for me. Um, and then you, you finally ask why and how to feel encouraged, motivated to keep const con to constantly keep surrendering. If you were really surrendering, you would feel how pleasant it is to be free of likes and dislikes. That itself would motivate you to surrender more and more and more. The more we surrender, the more we find how pleasant it is surrendering. How 
how pleasant it is to be free of likes and dislikes because then nothing affects us. And when nothing affects us, then we remain in our own natural state of pure happiness. That is what to start on the path of surrender, we need to understand that our likes, all troubles are caused by our, all the trouble we experience is caused by our likes and dislikes. To the extent we give up our likes and dislikes, to that extent it will be pleasant. We need to understand that to start on this path. If we actually start following this path, we will find that from our own experience. So there's no, um, that is surrendering will motivate, the more we surrender, the more it will motivate us to surrender. Because the more pleasant it will be. We'll sort of move along uh, to the next question, uh, which is, uh, it is very clear from Bhagwan's teaching that the only problem here is myself, the ego. If I attend to myself as much as possible without a break, one day, whenever that may be, the game will be over. With that said, when I attend to myself, the ego, with full focus and clarity, there is a certain heaviness that I feel in the center of my chest and I, and I come out of the practice. Again, I am not attending to any particular area in my body. I just attend to myself. The more I do this practice, the more heavy I feel at the center of my chest. Is this something to worry about? That is, awareness, what, whatever appears, it appears because we allow our attention to move away from ourselves. If our attention were firmly fixed on ourselves, nothing would appear. So when any anything appears in your case in this case it's a, a a heaviness in the chest to whom does it appear turn your attention back to yourself don't try and push away that i mean you can't get rid of that just ignore it don't attach no importance to it whatever appears will certainly disappear because the, the nature of things that appear, they appear and they disappear. Whatever appears and disappears is not real. What is real is only I am, only our fundamental awareness of our own existence, our own being, that is what is real. So that is what we need to hold on to. Let us not, as Bhagavan, according to Bhagavan, the whole world, everything other than ourselves is just a thought. And he says, in the sixth paragraph, however many um, thoughts arise, uh, so what? So let any number of uh, the sensations come in the body. Don't be concerned about them. Your only concern should be to whom do all, does all this appear? It appears only to me. So hold on to me, that me. Hold on to yourself. Don't be concerned about anything else. The, the less concerned you are about anything else, the more those things will drop off. Things appear only because we're holding on to them. If we let go of them, they will drop off by themselves. It's only our concern in anything other than ourselves. But the, because of our lack of, because we are not yet sufficiently willing to let go, we allow ourselves to be swayed by our vasanas, which draw our attention away from ourselves. So the vasanas manifest in the form of so many different types of thoughts, feelings, emotions, uh, perceptions, uh, bodily sensations, whatever. They appear so many things. These are all just the sprouting of our vasanas. Our aim is to hold on to self-attentiveness and thereby not allow ourselves to be swayed by these vasanas. So the only way to uh, overcome such distractions is to not allow yourself to be distracted by them, to hold on to self-attentiveness. Don't be concerned. Let any number of heavy sensations come in the chest or what, whatever. It's no concern of yours. Your only concern is knowing and being what you actually are. What you actually are is only I am. So hold on to I am and ignore everything else. Everything else will in due course drop off. So long as you're holding on to what is real, the unreal will drop off. Everything other than ourself, everything other than I am is unreal. It will all drop off sooner or later. So let's not be concerned about anything else. Let's be concerned only about holding on to I am. I hope that adequately answers that question. 
Um, the next question is, there are a lot of 12-step programs to deal with addictions. If we are just not to be swayed by our vasanas, some argue that it is a craving beyond our mental comprehension, and that's why people join 12-step programs, because addictions run so deep and are so tenacious. Could you speak on letting go of these vasanas in light of this? <laughs> I don't, I don't know about these 12-step uh, programs, but these may be helpful for people at a certain stage. But what, what Bhagavan has given us is the most powerful of all tools. By holding on to self-attentiveness, we are thereby not allowing ourselves to be swayed by even the subtlest of inclinations. Addictions, that is... When we allow ourselves to be swayed by vasanas, those vasanas give rise to likes and dislikes, which give rise to desires, which uh, result in uh, behavior, and then we get into patterns of addiction and so on. These are all far down the line. When, when we are practicing self-investigation, we are holding on to ourselves and thereby not allowing ourselves to be swayed even to a slightest extent by any vasana. If we're really doing it properly, if we're really holding on to ourselves, we're not allowing ourselves to be swayed by vasanas. If we're not swayed by vasanas, then there's no room for any likes or dislikes or desires or attachments or hopes or fears or any addictions or anything else. Nothing can arise so long as we're holding on to our I am. So this, this practice that Bhagavan has taught us, this is all in all. Nothing else is required. However, in order to follow this, it requires a certain dedication, a certain single-mindedness. Um, so for those who are not attracted to follow this path, they may be drawn to so many other different types of yoga things, uh, yogas or meditations or bhakti or, I mean, different forms of bhakti and so on, that those things may be appropriate for them. So these 12-point uh, programs, they may be suitable for some people, but if we've been drawn to Bhagavan's path, these things are not necessary because we, we're dealing with things at a much subtler level. And the subtler the level we deal with, the more effective, the more powerful it is. So, um, I mean, there's no compulsion. If, if we come to Bhagavan's path, if we're attracted to his path, if we are sufficiently attracted, we will not be this, we will, we will be naturally convinced that this is all in all. We won't be drawn to anything else. But if you are drawn to other things like the 12 point program or so on, maybe they're suitable for you. I mean, I'm not, I, I obviously can't judge that, but it's, uh, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't think it's necessary. All that is necessary is to hold on to I. If we hold on to I, that is cutting the, at the very root of all these problems. Uh, the next question is from Marcos. Marcos, would you like to ask the question? Namaskar, Mr. Michael. Namaskar. Uh, I would like to ask you a question. Uh, is it right to understand that God... Uh, that means, I, I guess, Ishwara selects the experiences that will compose our Parabda only as experiences that will ultimately drive us to realize the self. Yes, yes. God, God is nothing but our own self who appears outwardly. So we, we can say the infinite love that we have for ourselves, as we actually are, is what manifests in the form of God and Guru. So the outward form of God and Guru, the God or Guru who seems to be other than ourself, that is the power that is ordaining, that is allotting the fruit of our actions. And because it is a, a power of infinite love, love that is let's say Bhagavan, because that's a word that we're all familiar with. Bhag Bhag that is what we call God or Guru, that is Bhagavan. Bhagavan has infinite love. Bhagavan doesn't see us as other than himself. So he has infinite love for us as himself. 
because he loves us as himself, he wants us to be as himself, because what he himself is, is infinite happiness, which is what we actually are. So he wants us to be as we actually are. So, you know, uh, he, whatever he does, whatever fruits of our past actions, he allots for us to experience at this moment, that is where fruit but it will be, is most conducive to our making spiritual progress. We may not understand, oh, how can this particular experience that's happening to me today, how can this help me in spiritual progress? We need not understand that. We just need to, we, we need to recognize that such is the case. Because he is, because he is all uh, knowing, nothing can happen without his knowledge. Because he is all powerful, nothing can happen without his consent. And because he is all loving, he will not allow anything to happen that is not good for us. So whatever prarabdha we experience, it is what is best for us at this moment. Best means it is what is most conducive to our spiritual development. Uh, does, uh, does that adequately answer your question? Yes, thank you. But uh, can I add something? Yes. Can I ask? Uh, we, 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 we live under the sway of our vastness. Yes. Right. But where do comes but from? But we are not... We, we are, if we are swayed by our vasanas, that is because we choose to be swayed by our vasanas. We are not bound by our vasanas. We allow ourselves to be swayed by our vasanas. Vasanas get their power only from us. Uh, but what do, do comes from uh, that capacity of choosing to act or not to act? That is our freedom. That is the ver that's our nature. We we alone actually exist. So infinite freedom is our very nature. Now we have risen as ego, we have limited ourselves. So our freedom seems to be limited, but we are still free. So we are free either to be swayed. That, that is, as I said earlier, we are constantly being, um, that is, vasanas are pulling us in so many different directions, often in quite opposite directions. I have an inclination to do this. I also have an inclination to avoid doing it. So um, we, it's we who decide, am I going to be swayed by the, the inclination to do this or by the inclination not to do it? Um, so it, moment to moment in our life, we are deciding which vasanas we allow ourselves to be swayed by, which vasanas we don't allow ourselves to be swayed by. So we have this, we have this capacity either to be swayed or not swayed by any particular vasana. If we cling to self-attentiveness, we are thereby not allowing ourselves to be swayed by any vishaya vasana. We are instead being swayed only by the sat vasana, the inclination just to be as we actually are. So um, the more we cling to self-attentiveness, the more we, we weaken our vishaya vasanas. Weakening our vishaya vasanas to the extent that our Vishaya Vasanas are weakened, we are restoring the power to ourselves. The power that we have put, the Vishaya Vasanas derive their power from us. If we allow ourselves to be swayed by them, we are investing more and more power in them. So they become stronger and stronger. Now we are, we are reclaiming the power. But the power that we had invested in those Vasanas, we are now reclaiming it. We reclaim it by holding on to self-attentiveness. We are thereby not allowing ourselves to be swayed by the vasanas. We are thereby weakening them, and we are strengthening our ability not to be swayed by them. This is why Bhagavan says in the, in the sixth paragraph of Nana, he says, however many thoughts arise, so what? As and when each thought arises, if one vigilantly investigates to whom does it rise, it will be clear to me. If one by 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 if one practice if by 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 investigating who am I that means by holding on to that that is investigating to whom means turning our attention back to ourselves. If one investigates who am I, that means if one holds on to that self-attentiveness, 
the mind will return to its birthplace. Its birthplace means its source. It's, uh, our real nature is the birthplace of the mind. The mind will return to its birthplace, and the thought which arisen will subside. And then he says, Ipidi paraka paraka, by practicing and practicing in this way, manatiku tan pirapiditil tangi nikkum shakti adikadikindradu. The power of the mind to, uh, to remain in its birthplace increases. So the more we avoid being swayed by our Vaishaya Vasanas, the more we're weakening the Vaishaya Vasanas and increasing our strength to remain in the source. That, that power to remain in the source from which we rose, to remain in our birthplace, is what is called Sat Vasana. So we're strengthening the Sat Vasana, we're weakening the other Vasanas. Thank you very much. Right. Namaskar. Mm. Um, the next question is from Joe, uh, but she has asked a question. Joe, did you? Uh, okay, let, let me just ask this question. Trying to propagate Bhagwan's teachings when others are not open to it is also violating Bhagwan's teachings, right? In fact, it is violating Vedanta itself. Is that right? Yes. Yes. yes, it is going quite against Bhagavan's teaching. Bhagavan taught us, the teaching Bhagavan gave us is to turn our attention within. We sh if we go out and try and re re um, rectify the world, uh, or everyone should be following Bhagavan, therefore I have to go and teach the world, we are going direct in directly the opposite direction. The direction in which Bhagavan has directed us is to go more and more within. The next question is, um, you often mention that the mind and the breath are connected. If the mind subsides, the breath subsides too. Does this mean if one realizes himself, his breath stops? If you realize yourself, everything stops. <laughs> because as Bhagavan says, if ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. If ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist. So realizing ourself means being aware of ourself as we actually are. Ego is nothing but a false awareness of ourself. Being aware of ourself as I am this person, I am Michael or I am whoever, that is ego. When we're aware of ourself as we actually are, in other words, when we're aware of ourself as ourself alone, as I am I, then then there's no ego and therefore there's nothing else. So not only the prana will subside, the whole, as Bhagavan says, sakalam and virangam, swallowing the whole world. Bhagavan says in verse 27 of, of uh, uh, Aksharam Mumlai, sakalam and virangam, kadiroli yinamana jalajamalati daranachala, um, sun of bright rays that swallows everything, uh, 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 um, um, you blossom the lotus of my heart. He also say, pray, makes the, says exactly the same prayer in the first verse of um, uh, Arunachal Pancharatnam. Arul um, Nerevana uh, Amrakadale, ocean of grace in the form of a hill. Virikadi Ral Yavam Virungum, Aruna Giri Paramatma Ve. Arunagiri Paramatma, the Arunachal, the Supreme Self, who swallows everything in the light ray, rays of your, um, in your bright rays, um, uh, <coughs> um, uh, Paramatma Ve, Kila Ulapu Nandrai, the, the budding lotus, the, 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 the budding uh, lotus of my heart, uh, None drive well, make it blossom thoroughly. So make it make, make my heart blossom. That is my heart is beginning to bud, make it blossom thoroughly. Why? Because you are the sun of the, the sun whose bright rays swallow everything. So, what he means by the bright rays that swallow everything, when we know ourselves as we actually are, in that infinite ocean of pure awareness, everything will be swallowed. Why? Because ego is swallowed and everything exists only in the view of ego. 
the body, the world, everything. So since the body exists in the view of the ego, well, the pran also exists in the view of ego. Everything exists only in the view of ego. That's why Bhagavan says, if ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. If ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist. Therefore, uh, investigating what it is, that means investigating what this ego is, is giving up everything. So if we know what we actually are, that is giving up everything. What remains then, as Bhagavan says in verse 28 of Upadesha Undia, um, if one knows what the real nature of oneself is, then anadi, ananta, akanda, satchidananda. Anadi means beginningless. Uh, 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 ananta means endless, uh, limitless, infinite. Akanda means undivided, satchidananda. That satchidananda doesn't just begin when ego is annihilated. When ego is annihilated, we will find that it is beginningless. It is eternal. It, it never had a beginning. It never has an end. It is, and it, it's ever unbroken, ever uninterrupted. So that is the ultimate truth. So in that state, there's no such thing as prana. Prana seems to exist. Prana and body and everything, mind and world and everything seems to exist only when we rise as ego. Uh, the next question is from Srini. I think you wanted to ask the question. Yes. Uh, uh, namaskaram, Michael. Namaskaram. Um, uh, in a daily life that we are going through, when you don't like a particular thing, like um, I don't like this person, I don't like this thing, um, I don't like this nature of this, whatever the happening around the world, uh, mind always try to act. Uh, it tries to jump in the ego mind. Yeah. It says, oh, uh, try to uh, like say something or do some action, um, especially at, at work, at, at family. You try to do it by the nature of your, your, your patterns or behavior. So as part of um, self-surrender or self-investigation uh, practice, shall we do something like keep quiet and just Bhagavan let Bhagavan decide what to do or what is the best course of action in our day-to-day -day lives when we don't like something? Yes, keeping quiet is best. As Bhagavan said in that uh, last <laughs> sentence of the note to his mother, <laughs> Ahilin, nandru. So the best option is always to keep quiet. But what does it mean keeping quiet? What it means keeping quiet is not rising as ego. How to avoid rising as ego? Only by clinging to self-attentiveness. So to the extent to which we hold on to self-attentiveness, we will not be concerned about other things. So the, the, the only effective way to give up our likes and dislikes is to hold on to self-attentiveness. The more we hold on to self-attentiveness, the more our likes and dislikes will grow weaker and weaker, we'll be less concerned. Yes, okay, this world is full of good people and bad people. Some are very likable, some are very dislikable. Why should we have likes or dislikes for anything? As Bhagavan said, likes, virupu, virupu, rendame, virupu, takana. Likes and dislikes are both to be disliked. So we, we need to wean our mind off its likes and dislikes. We can do so only by means of self-investigation and self-surrender. Self-investigation and self-surrender are one of the same thing. Same, yeah. like two ways of describing the same thing. Yeah, I try to... Only way. Yeah, uh, when I try to practice it in daily life, like uh, yeah. at, at work or family life, it, it seems to be, like again, it's the ego mind. It seems to be... Um, difficult, like I try to calm down, let us take a situation when there is an argument, I try to say, okay, just let it go, just let it go and let, let it subside on its own. But it keeps on like the ego mind try to act upon it and say, oh, I want to do something, I need to do something to make it better. Maybe if I say something or do something, maybe it will calm down or it will probably make it better, the situation. Uh, so after Initially, practice self-inquiry, keeping quiet, it might, it seems to be working, but after a while, if it is still not getting, 
then somehow it 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 comes to our real nature comes to into picture our our whatever the ego mind our nature comes into picture and try to act upon it so is it is it um is it still probably practicing uh, is it uh, am i not practicing better or is there some tips that you can give to our uh, our the devotees okay the the reason it seems difficult is because we are not sufficiently willing nothing is easier than surrender surrender means letting go it's the easiest of all things but it seems difficult so long as we're not willing to let go so so long as we've got strong list likes and dislikes giving up our likes and dislikes seems to be very difficult that is why patient and persistent practice is necessary ipadi paraka paraka manatiku tampirapititil tangi nikkam shakti adikari kindradu as bhagavan says in six paragraph of nana by practicing and practicing in this way that means by constantly not allowing our mind to 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 go out after whatever appears whatever appears to whom does it appear turning our mind back within more and more and more and trying to hold on to that self attentiveness by practicing and practicing this way the power of the mind to remain in its birthplace uh to remain firmly in its birthplace increases so the, there's no shortcut that is the path bhagavan has given us this is the shortcut the one and only shortcut so there, there's no shortcut for the shortcut <laughs> we have to do this we have to we have to patiently and persistently um uh um uh continue trying to turn our attention within bhagavan sometimes said uh mind control is not your birthright you have to earn it you have to work for it mind control means hold on to i and thereby bring you about the subsidence of ego okay yeah it's a, i always see that doership is we should take out the doership let let uh, give it to bhagavan and he is the yes. one doing it and we are just instrument of it yes, but you yes. always uh, we always feel that like i always feel that okay i have i'm here to do do something like a job or whatever i do something so it comes naturally to do some action uh, otherwise it seems like we are just idle and we are doing nothing we are just keeping quiet and not doing what you are supposed to do here in this life in this world in a, in a worldly um, matters yes. so it seems like that i, I think it's probably like you mentioned the more of practice and perseverance yeah, and yeah. bhagavan's grace as well yeah we we cannot give up doership just by thinking i am not the doer <laughs> just like we cannot give up we cannot give up our identification by the body by thinking i am not this body who is thinking i am not this body ego and the very nature of ego is to identify itself with the body doership is another name for ego that is so long as we rise as ego we identify ourselves with these five sheaves uh mind speech and body are the three instruments of action which are all part of these five sheaves so so long as we take these five sheaves to be ourselves whatever actions are done by mind speech or body will be experienced by us as i am doing this so we we cannot give up doership without giving up ego that's why bhagavan says in verse 38 of vuludunapdu if we are a doer of actions we will experience the resulting fruit from this we can infer something else so long as we are experiencing the res- uh, resulting fruit of past actions we are still the doer we will cease experiencing the fruit only when we cease being the doer so if we have a doer of actions we will experience the resulting fruit if the, if uh, the, um if by if one knows oneself by investigating who is the doer of actions doership will depart that means ego will depart and all the three karmas will come to an end so doership is ego and ego is doership they are synonymous <laughs> you cannot you cannot have a a doershipless ego i am doing without doing so long as you're saying i am doing your your doership is there and doing yeah. without doership that that is meaningless we you yeah. can't do anything without doership the fact you're doing it means the doership is there we yeah. can give up doership only by giving up ego we can give up ego only by knowing what we actually are when we know what we actually are we will know our nature is 
pure being, not doing, just being. That's our real nature. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Uh, the next question is, uh, when we do Atma Vichara, is it possible to slip into Manalaya, Samadhi? How do we stop if that happens? I've heard stories of Bhagwan forcefully awakening people from Manalaya. Is that true? Um, I don't know uh, about stories. I, do, I, I hesitate to say because there are so many stories people say about Bhagwan and, um, and people have their different versions of the same story. So generally stories about Bhagavan, there are some nice stories, but we have to take them all with a pinch of salt. What we need to understand is what is Bhagavan's teachings. If we're practicing self-investigation, we cannot slip into Manolaya. If we slip into Manolaya, that means we cease to uh, in, uh, do Atma Vichara. That is, when... Our aim when we are doing Atma Vichara, we are trying to hold on to self-attentiveness. Our, uh, we, can, we can lose our hold on self-attentiveness in one of two ways. Either we can be swayed by our Vishaya Vasanas and begin to think about things other than ourselves, or we can slip into Manolaya, into sleep or Samadhi or whatever. It doesn't matter what type of man, what label you give it, it's all Manolaya. So long as we're holding on to self-attentiveness, if, if we're really holding on to self-attentiveness, we cannot be swayed by our uh, vasanas to think any thoughts, and we cannot uh, fall into manolaya. If we fall into manolaya, that means we've, lo we've lost our hold on self-attentiveness. Um, as far as sleep is concerned, we all need to sleep, because so long as the mind is active, it gets tired and therefore sleep is necessary. So if we are tired, we should sleep. When we wake up, we should continue our practice of Atma Vichara. So we, we shouldn't, there's a, we, we can't go on sleeping forever. If we could, there'd be no problem, <laughs> but we can't go on sleeping forever. So when sleep is needed, sleep, sleep well and get up and with the fresh mind, it's only in waking and dream that we can practice self-investigation. So. Uh, sleep as much as, as long as you need to sleep and then investigate yourself. So we need not worry about sleep. And uh, sometimes it will happen if we are tired, when we try to be self-attentive, we may fall asleep. No matter, sl sleep. And then when we wake up, we resume our self-attentiveness. That is, as Bhagavan said, it doesn't matter how many times we fail in this path. How many times our attention is drawn away to other thoughts or how many times we fall asleep, it doesn't matter. When we, when we, we need to continue, persevere in trying. So if you're sleepy, sleep. When you wake up, continue trying. That's all that's necessary. Sleep is not an obstacle. You can't make any spiritual progress in sleep, but you also can't go backwards in sleep. So sleep is a harmless state. In sleep, we are returning to our source and being as we actually are. But it is in the waking state, we need to experience ourself as we experienced ourself in sleep. As we in sleep, we experienced ourself just as the pure awareness I am. But because the ego had we, we fall asleep because of tiredness. So ego subsides, and as a result of the subsidence of ego, we experience ourselves as we actually are. Because ego has subsided, ego is not thereby destroyed. So in order to bring about the destruction of ego, ego needs to experience itself as pure awareness. To experience ourselves as pure awareness, we need to attend only to ourselves. The more we attend to ourselves, the more... Ego subsides, everything else drops off, and the more we begin to experience ourselves as that pure awareness, I am. Just I am alone, with, without any adjuncts. When, when eventually we experience ourselves as we actually are, that is when we experience ourselves as pure awareness, ego will thereby be destroyed. Because ego needs to experience itself as pure awareness. 
But ego cannot experience itself as pure awareness because as soon as ego experiences itself as pure awareness, it ceases to be ego and remains as pure awareness. So what realizes the self is only the self. There's no, uh, it's not, that pure awareness is, can never be an object known by ego. So ego needs to experience itself as pure awareness and thereby it will cease to be ego. And what then remains is only pure awareness. Does that adequately answer your question? Yeah, I think it probably does. Mm. Um, the next question is, um, it says, uh, there are two aspects to my question, our true nature and the practice of self-attentiveness. These are the two aspects. Mm. How can we be sure that our time, how can we be sure that our true nature is infinite happiness and not something worse than the false awareness called ego. I mean, I know that I am sat existence and shit awareness, but I'm not really sure about unlimited happiness because when I try to, to go deep into self-attentiveness, I become more simple-minded and duller and disconnected from the world. Surely I become more peaceful, but it's not really a radiant and joyful peace. It's like when I'm trying to go deeper into self attentiveness, deeper into I am, I become, as Pink Floyd would say, comfortably numb. Um, am I practicing wrong? Is the culmination of this path infinite happiness? Thank you. Yes, infinite happiness is our real nature. So um, self-investigation is not a state of numbness or a state of dullness. The more we attend to ourselves the more we are experiencing the clarity of our own awareness. That clarity of self-awareness is what Bhagavan called sporana. Sporana simply means shining forth or shining. So the clear shining of ourself as ourself, as I am I, that is sporana. So the more we attend to ourselves, the more we experience that clarity. So it is... It, if, you're, if the state you're experiencing seems to be a dull state, you're attending to something other than yourself. If you're attending to yourself and yourself alone, that is the state of perfect clarity. So it will not be felt as a dull state. The more we experience it, the more pleasant we will find it to be. So we'll be drawn back to it more and more and more. So if we, if we are practicing self-attentiveness, correctly, we will be experiencing clarity and we will be experiencing it as not a joy like the joy of um, having a good time, a good party or something. It is a, it's a far, far deeper and more enduring form of happiness. It, we can uh, describe it as peace, but it is, um, it is a it's something far more profound than what we normally call peace. It is that infinite happiness that we experience in sleep. But the problem is, though we experience infinite happiness in sleep, since we come out again, we now experience ourselves as ego. So we are now not experiencing ourselves as infinite happiness. So the, our present ignorance of ourselves clouds our. Um, our, our ability to recall what we experienced in sleep. That is why sleep seems to us to be a dull state, whereas in fact it's a state of infinite, pure being, pure awareness, pure happiness, pure love. That is what we actually are. That is all that remains in sleep. Now we need to try to experience that sleep here and now in the waking state. And we can experience that only by turning our attention back towards ourselves. Because all we experience in sleep is ourself. So if we want to experience sleep here and now, if we want to experience sleep in waking, a jagra shushupti, we need to uh, attend only to ourselves, not allow our attention to be diverted away towards anything else. I hope that adequately answers that question. That it, oh, you, you ask, how can we be sure? but it's a state of happiness. Bhagavan has given us very good reasons for understanding that it is a state of happiness in the first paragraph of Nana. What he says is, since all living beings like to be happy always without what is called misery, 
for, since for everyone there is greatest love only for oneself, and since happiness alone is the cause of love, that is, we all like to be happy, we have greatest love for ourselves, and what causes us to love anything is happiness. Only if something makes us happy, we love it. So the reason we love ourselves is because we ourselves is our happiness. That is one reason. And then he goes on to say, in order to obtain that happiness, which is one's own nature, why is it one's own nature? He's given a reason in the first three clauses. He then gives another reason, which one experiences daily in dreamless sleep. That is, we in, in sleep every day, we experience perfect happiness. So since we are not experiencing anything other than ourselves in sleep, since that is sleep is, a, as he says, sleep which is devoid of a mind. So since sleep is devoid of a mind, in sleep we are not experiencing anything other than ourselves, and we're perfectly happy. Why? Because we ourselves are happiness. So by reasoning, we can very clearly understand that happiness is our real nature. Then he concludes by saying, since such is the case, oneself knowing oneself is necessary. For that uh, jnana vichara, awareness investigation, called who am I, is the principal means. So he's given us reasons here for accepting that happiness is our real nature. But we can, with the, these are reasons that are expressed in words. These are all conceptual reasons. It's necessary to understand these reasons, but they will become clear to us only to the extent to which we put this self-investigation into practice. The more we turn within, the more we will experience that happiness which is our own real nature. The more we will, the more ego subsides, the more we will, we will experience the happiness that is ever shining within us. So if we are truly following this path of self-investigation, all doubts will be automatically dissolved by the clarity that we experience to the extent to which we attend to ourselves. So I, I hope this adequately answers that question. There's a question from Thiru. Thiru, would you like to, answer, to ask the question? Hello, Michael. Uh, Namaskaram. Hello. So my question is, uh, when I am not doing self-inquiry, uh, all the thoughts that I receive are almost linked thoughts. Uh, for example, like if I see a tree that leads to me, uh, leads to a different thought of my daughter who drew a picture of a tree that leads to a different thought and so on, on and on. But when I'm self-attentive, uh, when I'm practicing self-investigation, after a while of quiet mind, uh, if a thought comes up, it's almost all the time completely random, trivial thought, which I have never had before. For example, like uh, once I uh, got a thought of uh, me uh, taking a taxi to my office. This happened uh, several years ago. There is nothing important about it. I haven't thought about taxi or my office uh, before self-investigation. Uh, so I understand that uh, when we receive thoughts during self-investigation, we are supposed to go back and uh, be self-attentive again. That's what I'm doing now. But I'm just curious to know if Maharishi has said anything about these completely random, trivial thoughts which arise only during uh, practicing self-inquiry. That is, whatever thoughts arise, whether we are practicing self-investigation or not, all thoughts are nothing but the sprouting of our vasanas. As you say, when we, are, when we are caught up in thoughts, when we are allowing our attention to go outwards, there tends to be um, chains of association. So one thought leads to another associated thought, leads to another associated thought, and we branch out in so many directions. There is association there. When we are turning within, because we are trying to detach ourselves from the thoughts, it will seem that what thoughts arise are random because they're not directly associated with a, a previous thought. But it's all, uh, it's all whether, whether there's an association of thought or there's thoughts, unassociated thoughts arising, they're all the sprouting of our vasanas. The more we try to turn our attention within, the more the vasanas will rise to the surface of the mind because. Vasanas are our inclination to attend to other things. 
And it is the very nature of ego to have fast energy. It's the very nature of ego to be inclined to attend to other things. Why? Because, as Bhagavan says, ego, as he says in verse 25 of Urupatri Urupatriyundam, grasping form, it comes into existence. Urupatri Nikkam, grasping form, it stands. Urupatri Undu Mika Ongam, grasping and feeding on forms, it flourishes abundantly. Uruvittu Urupatram. So the very nature of ego is grasping thought, uh, grasping forms. Forms means phenomena, vishayas. So our inclination to grasp the vishayas are what are called vishaya vasanas. So uh, it, it is the very nature of ego to have vishaya vasanas. When we are trying to hold on to self-attentiveness, these vishaya vasanas will start uh, bubbling up because we don't want to let go of other things. So we, we, the inclination to hold on to, to think about this taxi or this irrelevant things arise in our mind. We need not be concerned about what it arises, why this thought rose, not another thought. It doesn't matter. We are not interested in the thoughts. We are interested in knowing ourselves, trying to find out why did this particular thought rise now when I hadn't thought about a taxi for so many years? It's a, that's an atma vichara. Atma vichara means holding on to self attentiveness. So we. Well, as soon as what, whatever the thought may be, whether it's a good thought, a bad thought, an indifferent thought, an irrelevant thought, doesn't matter. To whom is this thought? We turn our attention back to ourselves. That is, we don't have to ask to whom is this thought. As soon as a thought appears, it should remind us. Oh, this thought appears because I am. So to, to remind us to turn our attention back to ourselves. So don't, it doesn't matter what, as Bhagavan said, some people said to Bhagavan, oh, Bhagavan, when, I, when I'm doing meditation, all sorts of bad thoughts, all sorts of thoughts arise, even some very bad thoughts, thoughts that I wouldn't normally think, such thoughts arise. Bhagavan said, whatever's inside has to come out. Only if it comes out can you clear it out. So uh, we, how do we, so whatever vasanas are in our heart, they all have to arise sooner or later. So we may sometimes think about things that we've never thought about before. We may even think some very bad things that we, we never imagined we would think such thoughts. Th these are all just the sprouting of vishaya vasanas. How do we clear them out? By not allowing ourselves to be swayed by them. By Instead of allowing our mind to follow the thought, hold on to self-attentiveness. So it doesn't matter what, what we think about. Thinking about anything is allowing our attention to move away from ourselves towards something else. Our aim is to hold on to self-attentiveness and not allow our attention to be uh, moved away towards anything else. So you need not be concerned what type of thoughts arise, whether they're very, you may even have visions of God or what. So it doesn't matter. To whom is this vision? To me, who am I? So are, whether good thoughts or bad thoughts, it's a distraction of our attention away from ourselves. So we need to bring our attention back to ourselves. We shouldn't take any interest in these thoughts. Yes, that, that answers my question. Yeah, good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Right. Uh, the next question is, um, what is the connection between vasanas and gunas? Thanks, David. <laughs> vasanas are the seeds. Gunas are, are qualities, qualities that is um, only phenomena have qualities. We ourselves are niguna. So all vishayas have qualities of one kind or another. So vishayas are said to be visesha. Visesha means each, each, each vishaya, each phenomenon has certain distinguishing features features that distinguish each phenomena from each other phenomena. So whether physical phenomena or mental phenomena, each phenomena, we, we can distinguish it from other phenomena. If we couldn't distinguish it, they would all be, they, they wouldn't be phenomena. So the, the nature of phenomena is to have distinguishing features. These distinguishing features are what are called gunas. But why do phenomena appear? Because of our inclination to uh, allow our attention away from ourselves towards other things. So the, the Vishaya Vasanas 
of a seed that give rise to Vishayas, and the Vishayas have gunas. If there were no Vishayas, there'd be no gunas. If there were no Vishaya Vasanas, there'd be no uh, Vishayas. So the, the, the root is, uh, that is, uh, the seeds that give rise to Vishayas and their varying qualities are Vishaya Vasanas. How to get, so the problem is Vishaya Vasanas. How to weaken these Vishaya Vasanas? Only by clinging to self attentiveness. Does that adequately answer that question? Yes, thank you very much. Thank right. you, Michael. Right, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I was a bit slow in uh, clicking on the unmute. No, no problem. <laughs> Uh, there's another question from Jyoti. Uh, just, this is the follow-up uh, thought on Michael's question. Someone I know seems to be practicing surrendering everything to God. Many times I see the divine favoring his will, but there is one incident where the divine did not favor his desire. He did not want to marry the woman he is married to now. He had surrendered the decision uh, to God before marriage but he was still forced to marry the same woman. That incident scares me. It's interesting, though, that he does not stop surrendering other matters to God. So this agrees with Michael's answer that one must surrender to God even if one is going through hell. Uh, <laughs> he was not surrendering. If he had a liking, I want to marry this girl, not this girl, he still has a will of his own, so he hasn't surrendered. Surrender means having no will of our own, giving up our will entirely. If we give up our will, whether we're married to, the, uh, to an angel or to a devil, it doesn't matter. We, it'll be all equal to us. It's because of our likes and dislikes that our marriage either seems to be heaven or hell, or somewhere in between for most of us. It, that is, surrender means, surrender means, doesn't mean just giving up making decisions. It means giving up any concern about whether this should happen or that should happen. So long as we have likes and dislikes, to the extent to which we have likes and dislikes, we have not surrendered. To the extent to which we surrender, we will not have likes and dislikes. So you can't, you, you, you can't, it's a, it's a fallacy to think, but if you surrender to God, then God will do what you want. <laughs> if you surrender to God, you don't want anything. If you are expecting God to do something, God, I will surrender to you if you do what I want. You are not surrendering to God's will. You're asking God to surrender to your will. So it's we who have to surrender to him. He, we shouldn't ask him to surrender to us. So we shouldn't ask for anything. We shouldn't want anything. We should have no likes or dislikes. That alone is surrender. I've heard people say, or oh, when I surrender, often very famous, people even tell stories, or such and such happened, I surrendered this thought, and then it happened just as I wanted it to happen. We hadn't surrendered at all. The very fact that we wanted something to happen means we hadn't surrendered. So surrender means giving up our will entirely, not having any like or dislike at all. Yeah, it reminds me of that famous story uh, of Jesus uh, sort of having to bow to this merchant or some rich, somebody who was not particularly nice and saying that uh, it is not to your will that I bow. It's always this thing of thy will be done or in Islam, yes. there's always this thing of submission. However, yes, people yes, interpret yes, it. Yes, uh, yes. It's quite interesting. Yeah, it's... Islam means surrender. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. If only everyone would yes, surrender. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, once some, some Islamic scholars came to Bhagavan and one of them asked Bhagavan, uh, Swami, what is the goal of all, of all religions or all spiritual parts? Bhagavan said, Salam. Salam means peace. And then he asked, what is the means to, at to attain that goal? Bhagavan said, Islam. <laughs> so Bhagavan expressed his own teachings in their own language <laughs> because Bhagavan's path is Islam. True surrender, complete surrender, that is Bhagavan's path. 
And I think, unfortunately, when people think of surrender, they don't think of surrendering the ego. <laughs> no, and all the, exactly. And all the identities that go with it and, no. uh, you know, and all the <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. different idols and icons. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Uh, the next one is, again, um, okay, it's a... Okay, it's another question. Now, it seems a contradiction to not intrude in others' affairs and to say that what one gives or does to others, one is giving only to oneself as, in quotation marks, all that one gives to others, one is only giving to oneself. Because, that seem, because it seems that as long as we understand it, we would like to give our best to all and thus to us with a capital U. How can this contradiction be resolved? Should we just leave the world be as it is without touching it? Or should we try to make things better? If we know Bhagwan's teachings are pointers to reality and that only can be a good thing, why is it inappropriate to promote these teachings or to try to tell people about it whenever it seems appropriate? When it seems it, it is appropriate to tell people about Bhagavan's teachings when they ask, when, or when they show signs of being open to such ideas, of wanting to, of seeking to know something, then we can tell if, they, if they're willing to be open to, if, if they show signs of being open to these sort of ideas, then we can tell them about, about Bhagavan's teachings. We shouldn't tell them. Uh, we, we shouldn't tell to each and every one. We, we should see whether they, they show signs of, I mean, if, if people will make it clear. If people are, are, are seeking some answers, then it may be appropriate to give answers from the perspective of Bhagavan's teachings. But if they show that these answers don't appeal, if they show that the answers don't appeal to them, then we should Keep quiet. We shouldn't try and uh, we shouldn't try and convince anyone who doesn't want to be convinced. There is no that is intruding in others affairs. Do you like other people intruding in your affairs? No, or none of us like people intruding in our affairs. So intruding in 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 others affairs is not. Uh, we may think that we can help someone by intruding in their affairs. Often, we, if we try to help people by intruding, uh, going where, we're not, where, where we haven't been invited, we will find we are actually doing the inappropriate thing. So we, we, if others ask us for help, then we can give help if, we, if it's within our ability. But if others don't ask us for help, we shouldn't go and try and interfere in their affairs. And tell them you shouldn't do like this. You should do like this. Give uh, giving unwanted advice, um, trying to. Um, I mean, there are so many ways people try and interfere in others' affairs. I think I may have. We we may think that we have all the answers, but we see two people having a having a. Supposing two people have a falling out, we think we may be able to rectify it. But if we interfere and get them to reconcile, we may just make things worse. So we, we should give, when Bhagavan says whatever is given to others, he means whatever is appropriate to give. What is appropriate is if someone have office, obviously has a need, and if it's clear that we have something that can meet that need, then we should do. But we shouldn't of our own accord go in uh, interfering in their affairs, telling them what they should do, or trying to influence others. It, we, when we interfere in others' affairs, more often than not, it just creates more trouble. And the main reason why Bhagavan says we shouldn't interfere in others' affairs, we shouldn't be concerned about these things. Of course, if someone comes to us and needs some help and asks for help, we give appropriate help. But we more and more, we should be trying to to, uh, to leave, that is, we are trying to surrender our burden to God. Take, interfering in others' affairs is taking others' burden on our head. When, we should, when our aim is to surrender our own burden, if we, instead of surrendering our own burden, we're taking on more burden, we are trying to play God. Let's not play God. The one who bears all burdens is God. Let him bear all burdens. Let us surrender our burdens and everyone else's burdens to him. 
When I say let us surrender other people's burdens, let us not take other people's burdens on our head. There's a question uh, from Grant. Would you like to ask Grant? Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, uh, I'm very new to um, self-inquiry and, and the teachings of Ramana Mahashi. Um, but I think the first exposure I had is very obvious that you, you're dealing with truth, absolute truth that is unbelievably profound. And I think I've had an intuitive sense of what self-attentiveness is and all the interest I've had to date on a conceptual level, I end up just coming back to the sense of the importance of his teachings is the self-attentiveness. Every solution, self-attentiveness. And like I say, I think I have an, an intuitive grasp of it. And I think I've probably had some exposure to this path before in previous lives. And I, I just, I'd like, Michael, if you can just help me understand maybe from your point of view, what, what self-attentiveness is, what self-inquiry is, the, the actual practice of it. I mean, the, the discussion about vasanas and action in the world and living our life and uh, eroding away the ego, that's all interesting and great, and I'd, I'd love to learn more. But it's the, the self-attentiveness, the actual practice of sitting without going out into the world. Uh, it's that that has struck me in coming across to Ramana, and yeah, that's that's my question. If you can maybe give me an idea on your okay, um, being self attentive, learning to be self attentive is a bit like learning to ride a bicycle. It's we can learn to ride a bicycle only by getting on a bicycle and trying. The more we try, the more we slowly get the hang of uh, balancing on a bicycle. After a few weeks of trying, then it becomes natural to us. We're easily able to cycle. Likewise with self-attentiveness. We, we can learn how to be self-attentive only by trying to be self-attentive. Bhagavan's teachings are pointers towards self-attentiveness. That is, ultimately, all Bhagavan's teachings are pointing us towards self-attentiveness. Um, he has given us many pointers that can, if we think deeply about what he said, it, the more we understand his teachings, the clearer it will, the clearer we'll be able to understand what we should be trying to do. We should be trying just to attend to ourselves. That is, first we need to understand what we are not. We are not this body, we are not this mind, we are not this will, we are not anything that appears and disappears. We are that fundamental awareness I am. So first we need to understand that. So that is the self we are trying to attend to, just that mere awareness of our own being, that mere awareness I am, that is what we're trying to attend to. And so we're not attending to any object. That is, we, we, till now we've been so accustomed to attending to objects, at first it seems difficult. How can we attend to something that is not an object? But we can attend to anything we're aware of. We're aware of objects, so we attend to them. But whether we're aware of objects or not aware of objects, the one thing we are always aware of is our own existence, our own being, I am. So we are trying to hold on to that which is ever ever-present, ever-unchanging, the, the, the ground of, of, of all other experiences, the screen on which all, that Bhagavan sometimes ex, ex, uh, described all experiences as pictures appearing on, as like pictures appearing on a cinema screen. Whereas our own fundamental awareness I am, that is the screen on which they all appear. This is a nice analogy, but we shouldn't take it too far because the screen is something other than ourselves. In this case, the screen is ourself. We are the screen on which all these pictures appear. So we are trying to attend just to our mere being, to our mere awareness I am. That's as far as words can go. Because that, as Bhagavan said, when people ask Bhagavan this question, he said, if the way were objective, it could be shown objectively. This is not objective. This is a subjective path. We are, we are trying to turn our attention away from all objects back towards the subject. 
And not even to the subject, to the reality of the subject, to what lies behind the subject, because the subject is ego. The mixed awareness, I am this person. So it's a mixture of uh, the pure awareness I am and adjuncts. It's only that pure awareness I am, that fundamental awareness, that is what we are trying to attend to. How to attend to it? We just have to try. The more we try, the clearer it becomes. I think if I can just make one last comment, I think yes. a part of the reason for the question is uh, at, the, at the very beginning, literally the very first few weeks of coming across the teachings and putting it into practice, uh, immediately I had a sense of what, what the teachings were pointing at, the sense yes. of I. And I've actually found over three or four, five months that it's harder to grab a hold of. Um, and paradoxically, uh, uh, it, it seems to me that that's actually progress in, in as much as the ego is so proud, stands so proud, starting to watch it over the course of three or four months, it's harder to grab a hold of. And the practice itself seems to be that much harder, but, but not. It, uh, that's what I say. It's a bit of a paradox. I don't know if that makes sense. But it, it does make sense. It does make sense because at first, when we begin to attend to ourselves, we have a fairly unrefined um, that 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 is we, we we understand conceptually what this is about, but that 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 conceptual understanding is fairly unrefined. So at first it seems, but we are we we are attending to ourselves. Then we begin to recognize. How very subtle is ourself? How very subtle we are. So we are trying to attend to the subtlest of the subtle. So at the same time, we are aware of ourselves, but it, at the same time, it seems evasive. That we're aware of it, but it still seems evasive. Yeah, what is evasive exactly. is is the is to we are always aware I am. What we are not aware is what I am, because now we are aware of ourselves as I am Grant or I am Michael. We are identifying ourselves as a certain person. So along with the person comes so many things. I'm sitting, I'm talking, I'm walking, I'm doing this, that, that all these uh, uh, adjuncts are added to I. Now we're trying to extract I from all these. We're trying to attend only to I. So we're attending to the subtlest of the subtle. Um, the, the thing is, just to be steady in our practice, to persevere, to keep on trying, the more we try, the, the more the clarity will shine forth from within. So even though sometimes it may seem elusive, we are all, what is elusive? I am. Can I ever be elusive? No, I is always clear. So we need to be reminding ourselves uh, what we are attending to is not anything other than ourselves. We are not looking for something, but we don't know. We are attending only to that which we always know. Bhagavan often used to say, Atmanyana, that's the awareness of ourselves as we actually are, is not a new knowledge to be attained. We are always are aware of ourselves as we actually are, but superimposed on that are all these adjuncts. So we seem to be not aware of ourselves as we actually are. So we are not trying to know anything, but we do not know already. We are just trying to know ourselves in isolation from other things by trying to focus our awareness on ourselves alone. The focusing awareness on the awareness that is aware of itself as I. So it, it is a, it, it, this is a very deep and subtle path, but at the same time, it's a very simple path. So we, we shouldn't, we shouldn't, that this is where reading Bhagavan's teachings and thinking deeply about his teachings helps a lot because we, uh, otherwise we can, we can slip into confusion. And we, to the extent we're confused, we're not practicing properly. So we need to clearly understand what this is. We are just trying to, attend to that which is ever present to that background awareness that fundamental awareness i am it, that it's it's very difficult to put it in words and sometimes the more we try to put in words the the, the clumsier it becomes we just need to understand what the words are pointing at and face in that direction they're pointing only at ourselves we need to face ourselves alone that's why bhagavan called this path 
vichara. Vichara means investigation. So we, the, the more we investigate ourselves, that is, the more we attend to ourselves, the clearer it, the way becomes. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. But as you said, you also said another very important point. So long as you're feeling, I am, I am making progress, I am doing this well, that is ego. It's, it's, the more we go into this path, the more we will be aware of our complete inability, our complete lack of love to follow this path. But, but the more we become aware of our own, um, our own inadequacy, the more ego subsides. And that is our aim, the subsidence of ego. The dissolution of ourself in what we actually are, the dissolution of ourself in ourself. Uh, there's just one more question. So, just before that, uh, following up on what Grant was saying, um, uh, very often, uh, I mean, we're sort of identified, I mean, we're kind of absorbed in a thought or a feeling or a response or whatever it might be. And the moment we become aware of it, and we just become aware and just let it go, we just sort of fall back into that awareness itself and away from the object, and then, you know, there is that greater feeling, I mean, of, uh, of a kind of a spaciousness or just whatever uh, being. Um, uh, would that be one way of uh, sort of thinking about uh, self-investigation, that we just, the moment we become, I mean, we just make us, I mean, instead of being uh, absorbed and identified with a particular thing, a particular emotion yeah. object, we just become aware of it and then just, within that moment, yes. let it go yes. and just fall into the awareness itself, which has become aware. Yes, 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 that, that, that is it. But it's very difficult when we put it into words. It can easily be, be misinterpreted. That is, um, no words can adequately express it. Um, because one thing we have to be very careful of, one, one, one thing people don't understand clearly enough is it's not just a matter of not being aware of other things. No, it's not just a matter of letting go of other things. We need to be holding on to ourselves. Every night when we fall asleep, we let go of everything, but we don't know ourselves as we actually are. So it's not just a matter of withdrawing the mind from all thoughts. It's a matter of focusing our attention on ourselves. If we attend to ourselves, our attention is automatically withdrawn from other things. But if we merely withdraw our attention from other things, this is what they're doing in yoga. Yoga's chitta vritti nirodha. They're trying to withdraw their mind from all other things with the aid of, um, of pranam and other means. They try to withdraw their mind from everything else. That leads to manolaya. What, what they call Nivikalpa Samadhi Bhagavan said, that is just manolaya. That, that, that is, if you withdraw your mind from everything else, you then subside in manolaya, as we do every day in sleep. What's important is not merely ceasing to be aware of other things, being aware of ourselves, holding on to that self-awareness, holding on to that fundamental awareness of our own being. That's very, very important, because that is the key. It's the self-attentiveness that is the key to, um, to success. I mean, we can know ourselves only by attending to ourselves. So we might say that every time we fall back into that awareness, yes, we yes. just sort of, because, again, one can't really grasp it because then you end up doing something again. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So you, can't, it, so you it, just have to sort of naturally uh, yeah, yeah. It, keep falling it, back it, into this it. Is, this is a very, very subtle path, and it's very easily we can slip this way or that way. That's why, it's, that's why sometimes this path is described as a razor's edge. We are balancing. We, we are doing a balancing act between, on the one hand, succumbing to vasanas and, and slipping into thought, and on the other hand, slipping into manolaya. We, we need to avoid both, by, and we can avoid both only by holding on to ourself. And our self is something very, very subtle that we're trying to hold on to. But we could say that if we just allow ourselves to just sort of rest in that awareness that we fall back into without you know, as much as yes. possible. So, so long, but it's very easy in, in, that, in that trying just to rest in that, it's very easy to slip into manolaya. That's why we need to hold on to that self-attentiveness. 
Uh, you mean uh, sort of uh, being aware of that awareness in a way? Uh, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Uh, rather than just becoming blanked out in some Yes, 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 yes. That's why I said someone else who said it's a, it's a dullness. If we're feeling it to be a dullness or lack of clarity, that is we're getting close to Manolaya. We need to, what we need is clarity. Bhagavan said, if we, in, in Vichara Sangraham, there's a very nice passage right at the beginning of Vichara Sangraham, in which he says, if one investigates what it is that is now shining as I, the, then a, a, a spuripu, a, a, a clarity, a fresh clarity will shine as I am I. What he's referring to there. Is um is is that is when when our attention is fixed on ourselves, the more our attention is fixed on ourselves, the greater is the clarity of awareness of ourself as ourself alone. That is what we are what we are trying to hold on to. That awareness of ourself as ourself, what he Bhagavan called I am I. So it, it, holding on to that I is all important. That feeling of awareness, that aliveness. Yes, yes, yes. That, that clarity, that inner clarity, that, that which is shiny in our heart as I. Because that's the source of all light. That is, from where does the mind get its light? From where does the mind get its awareness? It's only from that fundamental awareness I am. So that is the original source of all light. Of course, light is a metaphorical term. <laughs> People say, I didn't see any light. I looked inside, I didn't see any light. <laughs> you yourself are the light that you're looking for. Uh, the last question is, um, I know surrender is not avoiding, but we do have to take action in life. I think it would be easy to say I'm surrendering, but actually one is just avoiding uh, decisions. Could you speak uh, about this? Whatever actions we need to do, that is, whatever actions need to be done by our body, speech, and mind, they will be made to do. As Bhagavan said in the note he wrote for his mother in the first sentence, Avarava prarabdha prakaram, according to the prarabdha, the destiny of each one, adakarnavan, he who is for that, that means God or Guru, Angangirandu, meaning being, literally means being there, there. That means being in the heart of each one of them. That's what it implies. Artivipan will make them act. So whatever actions need to be done by our mind, speech, and body in order for Prarabdha to unfold, our mind, speech, and body will be made to do that. So we need not be concerned about such action because they will be made to do them. Our only aim should be to hold on to self-attentiveness let the leave the body, speech, and mind. Leave that in Bhagavan's care. Let him make the body, speech, and mind do whatever they're meant to do. Our only aim should be attending to ourselves. Um, we 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 need not fear about being actionless because whatever actions the body, speech, and mind need to do, they'll be made to do. What we need to avoid is acting under the sway of our vasanas. Allowing our attention to move away from ourselves is the beginning of acting under the sway of our vasana. So, so, because it's only under the sway of our vasanas that our attention moves away from ourselves. And when our attention moves away from ourselves, that gives rise to thoughts. And thoughts give rise to speech and to actions. So all actions begin from allowing our attention to move away from ourselves. So we need to hold on to self-attentiveness and thereby not allow our attention to move away from ourselves. Then that is surrendering our body, speech, and mind to Bhagavan. He will make them do what they, he's going to make them do anyway. That is what, what, what the actions that we need to do for our prarabdha to unfold, we'll be made to do those actions. We, there means our body, speech, and mind, not we. We are holding on to what we actually are and letting our body, speech, and mind do whatever actions Bhagavan makes them do. So we need to, we, we need to lose all, all interest in action. Neither, that is, those actions which we're destined to do, that's Bhagavan's concern. He'll make us do both. All other actions, I mean, any action other than those actions are actions we're doing under the sway of our vasanas. Those are the actions we need to avoid, not by just by avoiding the action, by avoiding allowing ourselves to be swayed by the vasanas. If, to the extent to which we don't allow ourselves to be swayed by vasanas, 
to that extent, will we avoid doing actions under their sway? In other words, we'll avoid doing our gamya. Um, there is a last question, which right. I've mistakenly found somewhere right. else. Um, the question is, uh, did Bhagwan encourage performing acts of charity, example, feeding the poor? Bhagavan says in this paragraph, whatever is given to others is given only to oneself. So, uh, yeah, doing any, any, anything appropriate. But we, again, there, there's a danger in everything. If you, if you make your life mission to, to be feeding the poor people, you can, if you're a rich person, you can be a talent, philanthropist. But it's very easy then to get, to get sucked into that. I am doing good. These people, uh, that, that is, the main aim of Bhagavan's teaching is not allowing this ego to rise, making ego subside more and more and more and more. That should be our focus. Yes, if there's, if there's opportunity to help people, if people don't have food, we should certainly give them food. But doing good work in this world is not our aim. Our aim is not to do anything. Our aim is to be as we actually are. So we, we, need, to, uh, we need to keep our focus on, turning, or, on looking it within, not looking outside. If it's our destiny to feed poor people, then Bhagavan will make this mind, speech, and body do whatever is necessary to feed poor people. Let us not be concerned about such things. Our only concern should be turning within more and more and more. Of course, if we've got food and a hungry person comes and asks us for food, we should give our food, even if it means we go hungry. Better to give your food to them because you're giving only to yourself. But give, that, that, that is, Bhagavan's path is an inward path, facing inwards. If we're facing inwards, then we won't have attachment. We'll be, if we are really following Bhagavan's path of turning within more and more and more, and if a hungry person comes and asks us for food, we'll be more than happy to give our own food to them. Yeah. Because we, we're, not, we're no longer concerned about this person that we seem to be. So we will happily give our food away. It, it, in, that, in that spirit we should be giving to others. Not, not that we're seeking to, how can I help people? What good can I do in this world? We are facing outwards then. Our aim is to face within more and more and more. Thank you. I just wondered whether feeding the poor and all our acts of, uh, it's again feeding our ego. <laughs> it can be feed. That is, that is the trouble. That, that is nishkarmiya karma is good. It will help to purify the mind. But it's very, very easy for, the, for, yeah. for kamiyata, kami, kamiyata to creep in in so many ways. Satisfying your ego, feeling I am a good person, that itself is a great kamiyata. So yeah, yeah. The, 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 that's why Bhagavan said, the Atmanyani alone can be a good karma yogi. Because so long as there's ego there, it's so easy for um it satisfies our, our we, we if we if if we are if we are a good person we will naturally feel satisfaction giving to others so so thinking i'm doing good action i'm doing nishkarmiya karma why are we doing the nishkarmiya karma for our own satisfaction that's why bhagavan said nishkarmiya karma done for the, for god kartana kakam nishkarmiya karma so it has to be for the love of God and uh, the love of God alone, not for any other reason. But it's very, very difficult, much safer to follow Bhagavan's path of clinging to self-attentiveness. <laughs> that is, so long as we're clinging to self-attentiveness, we're not giving room to the ego to rise. As soon as the ego begins rising, we catch it. Because ego, ego rises because we don't look at it. When we're looking outside, ego is happily dancing when we look at it it hides Tain in our lotum pinnacle if sort it takes flight so bhagavan's path is the safest path the simplest path trying to be self-attentive more and more and more if you are following this path then being generous sharing with others it'll come it'll be second nature to you you won't yeah. feel i'm i am i am feeding the poor it'll be just natural there's a hungry person okay what's more natural than giving food to a hungry person so being egoless that is 
that is the subsidence of ego is what Bhagavan's teachings are all about. So as you say, it can be very dangerous doing this. Uh, it, in the name of Nishkarmiya Karma, we can be just <laughs> feeding the ego. Yeah, yeah. As you say, we're not just feeding the poor people, we're feeding this poor ego. Yeah. 